Grab your rods and tackle box, folks, as we dive into the wild world of fishing. Get ready for some laughs, some fish stories, and a touch of chaos as we wade into the deep waters of fishing wisdom. Our guides on this trip are a know-it-all, a guy who desperately needs a haircut, and a man named Sam. In this podcast, this Motley crew shares their knowledge, their latest fishing antics, and probably get into more trouble than they bargained for. It's a podcast as unpredictable as the sport of fishing. If you love fishing, then this is the place to be, because in this podcast, every catch is a big one. Every story is a keeper, and the only thing more legendary than the tales is the trio delivering them. Welcome to the Bait Tank. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the second official episode of the Bait Tank Fishing Video Podcast. My name is Anthony with Yaksher Outdoors. And joining me this week, we have, oh, where'd he go? He's still smoking a cigarette. Give me a second. We have Zach back from last week, our last episode. And we also have Sam, the man, Sam, who will be joining us as well. Uh, so once Zach's done with a cigarette, I'll get him up on screen. Sam will not have a camera tonight. And as you can see, I am in my car. I am currently on vacation in Crystal River, Florida. Uh doing some saltwater fishing for a prize that I won for a trash collection challenge back in September. And uh, we're having a blast. But, yes, I wanted to make sure we did the podcast still and kept it going and was consistent for you guys. Uh, today's episode, we're talking about two major topics. We're talking about fishing in winter, uh, some strategies that the three of us uh, think about, or at least two of us, um, in terms of open water fishing. And then secondly, we're going to take a little deeper dive into ice fishing, which is another type of winter fishing uh, and the in the opposite form of fashion. There's two people that know more about ice fishing than the other one because the one guy's from Alabama, as you guys know, is actually from Alabama. And Sam, who's joining us tonight, is from Michigan. So we're going to get this thing started pretty soon. Once Zach turns on the camera, we'll get him up on here. But first thing, let's say some hello to some people. We have Mike Sampson in the house. Welcome in, buddy. Welcome in. And we have Mrs. Viking who also said hello. And for anybody else that's alive and tuning in, feel free to say hello. Tell us where you're watching from. We would love to hear about it. And if you've been fishing at all in the last week or so or at all this year so far, we want to hear about it as well. Speaking of one of the men, one of men of the show, Zach, how are you? Oh, how are good. things? How are you doing? I am doing good, man. I am doing good. Got on some redfish today. Got on some black drum. Uh, even caught some sea trout. So I definitely got some fish to bring back to Tennessee. Uh, looking forward to going out again tomorrow and keep that party rolling. Uh, Sam, I'm assuming you can hear me okay? Yes, sir. Feel free to say hello to everybody. And why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your fishing background and what got you into the sport of fishing? So my name is Sam. I'm from northern Michigan, just as far north as you can get without being in the Upper Peninsula, uh, about an hour away from the Canadian border. So if I have a little bit of a Uper accent, that would be why. Uh, I started fishing when I was about three years old. Um, my mom got me into fishing with a Donald Duck pole uh, that she found at a Kmart, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, trying to think i mostly do bank fishing i've been i do boat and uh down rigging fishing for salmon lake trout things of that nature uh yeah well, perfect so what is your favorite species to go for my favorite species is walleye um they're mostly active at night, at least where I fish at, uh, which is Crooked Lake. My family has a cabin on there. Uh, so they're mostly active at night, which in the summertime kind of plays an issue because it doesn't get dark in the summer till like 10, 30, 11, and I'm kind of old. and I want to go to bed around when they started fighting. Uh, but in the wintertime, it's kind of, you know, just go deep and uh, pretty easy peasy. If walleye aren't biting during the day, I like to go for bass. Um, it's kind of like my go-to. Sure. All right. So what is your – your? Oh, so you said walleye was your favorite species. So what's your personal best walleye? And then on top of that, what is the biggest fish you've ever caught? Uh, hmm. 
So my personal best walleye would be around 13 pounds. Um, That's a big walleye. Actually, it's probably closer to 10. It's probably one of those fishing stories. It happened probably about 15 years ago, so my brain's a little foggy. But Uh, I had his head over my head, and his tail was hitting my belt. Um, So it was a very nice fish. Still a very nice walleye, for sure. Yeah. Um, The largest fish I've caught probably, and this is a small fish, or well, for the species, it's a small fish, but it was about a six foot long uh, sturgeon, uh, which I caught in a kayak in the Indian River, and that wasn't fun at all. Uh, it, <laughs> and that thing took me all over the place. I was fishing with 10 pound tests, hauling in this monster. I had no idea what I caught because it was um March or April, like it was uh, early spring still, and I was just going all over the place. Wherever this fish wanted to go, I was going with it because I didn't have an anchor on this kayak or nothing. It just, he was the boss. I got you. Well, I know that's kind of the way Zach likes to roll with a big catfish. He likes being drug around and basically not having any control of anything. I know it's fun for me too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're not if you're not willing to do it, then I understand that entirely. But it's definitely, uh, I'm sure an adrenaline uh, rush. I'm sure you were excited at least when it happened. And you got done with it. But I was sure excited was and scared at the same time because this was, you know, uh, it was called Burt Lake, and it's still very cold. Like there's chunks of ice that was um, like still on the shoreline. So hypothermia was a real concern. Like if I tipped over. Sure. For those who are tuning in, like I said, I am streaming from a Taco Bell parking lot. <laughs> Just so I had good a phone signal to do this because the phone service is not that great in the area. So if we are experiencing any kind of lag, just let me know and I will see what I can do to help it. But for the most part, this is probably about as good as it's going to get. So again, if you're hanging out, please say hello. Tell us about your favorite kind of fish, whether or not you've done any fishing yet this year. Um, with the exception of the fish I've caught today, I've only caught one other fish. I caught a carp uh, last weekend. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that, that's been my year so far as a 15 and a half pound common carp. And then, like I said, we caught my wife and I caught several black drum redfish and we caught a couple of trout today as well. And I'll be going out again tomorrow, but, uh, even actually going from today's experience, we're talking about winter fishing. You know, we, we chase these fish year round, especially if you're open water fishing and, there's a couple of things you have to consider and everybody looks at it a little bit different. Um, in this particular case, uh, Sam has expressed that in the winter, typically he does no fishing until ice over and when it's thick and safe to go out. So he does ice fishing, which we'll be covering during the second topic of today. But I do know that Zach fishes in the winter all year round, just like I do myself. And, uh, there are definitely some things to consider. Um, And from my perspective, the biggest thing is learning where the bait goes. Um, If you're fishing for bass or any kind of predatory species, learning where those bait fish go will at least not, it'll at least keep you around fish, but it'll also put you in the potential spot for if there is a feeding window, because the active fish will be moving and following that bait. Whereas the dormant uh, non-active fish will pretty much be hugging cover. And that leads me to my second point, which for me, like I said, study the bait fish, everything they do, and then cover more water. Those are the two things I, I keep in mind. What about you, Zach? What, 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 do you, uh, what do you keep in mind when it comes to fishing for fish in the winter, just, just from a general scale? And then we'll do a little deep dive into that stuff. I, I don't, I'm not like everybody else where I stay focused on, like, since I hunt catfish, I don't only use skipjack in the winter. I rarely use skip jack in the winter. It's being able to adapt in the winter using different techniques. I mean, it could be so much as they're not wanting to come off off the bottom. So you throw a Carolina rig out there, short leader, and you're good. <clears throat> it's just those things you got to learn to adapt to mainly. That's what I try to keep in mind. If something's not working, if I'm not finding bait, it's – figuring out where the baits move to like uh a lot of times this time of year i use gizzard shad and they're running in coves and stuff like that during the day and they're out deep at night 
So it's just, when can I go get my bait? How much bait am I going to need? And it's, I mean, last year I fished during a snowstorm. So it's staying warm, all that stuff, making sure you have proper clothing. It's, yeah, we'll cover that too. You know, like you said, there are obviously some safety concerns to consider when you're fishing in colder weather, especially if you're fishing on a kayak or a small boat. That's not so bad on the bank because obviously if you're you're not gonna sit in a you know a mud puddle to fish, you're gonna sit somewhere that's probably covered or at least a little bit out of the wind. Um just because they make it easier to fish in the first place. But you can you know, depending on where you're at, you can always have a fire or something to warm up and stuff like that too. Or on you know, kayak, like some people some people a, on the kayak I keep a dry bag that has a tank of clothes. Just to say just just in case something goes bad. A fire starter, just pretty much a survival kit. Sure. And it's a good idea to have something like that on a regular boat, too. But I also know some people that run heaters on their boats. Um, I know some people actually, when they're bank fishing, if they can, they'll sit in their car and just watch the rods. That way they can stay warm and dry. And that works great uh, as long as you have the patience for it. I mean, obviously, if you're fishing, like we, we fish with a toddler a lot. Um, so that's not really an option for us because she gets bored in the car, obviously. But... You know, either A, we find a babysitter, or B, we just don't go, or C, we try to find somebody with a boat and go on a boat with them, or we find an open spot where she can at least crawl around and play for a little bit. That's but, actually against the law, like, to watch from your car. That's actually against the law here in Michigan. Like, you need to be, like, around your uh, hardware at all times. You know what? Actually, I remember watching a video. I watched, uh, uh, It was a guy from the U.K. who came over and carp fished with some boys up there in Michigan. And yeah, the TWFs are actually told him that, that it was illegal uh, to do that because he was using those bite alarms like I got, but he was had them, they all had the rods spread out. But the, he had one that was about a 50 yard sprint to get to. And I remember the T, the uh, DNR officer told him that he couldn't do that anymore. And I do remember they're a little lenient here in the winter time, uh, just because. Uh, you know, you're fishing out of a four to eight inch hole. So there's some leniency there. And I know some people that just, uh, they drill three holes because you're only allowed three lines in the water. And yeah. um, they'll have spread out. They'll just, yeah, they'll spread out like, I've seen them like 100 yards away. And they're just out there with binoculars on their snowmobile. So they're like, they can get there within seconds, but. If you're just chilling in the summertime, just in your car, enjoying the AC, the DNR is like, no, no, no. Right. No, I get you. And, and, you know, there very well may be a law like that here in Tennessee, but I have not heard of it. And I know, I'm assuming Zach hasn't heard it either, because I know him and I both have fished out of our car several times and see other people do it. Um, and that you really just depends. Like, when I, when I, one morning. I did. He, he, he was live stream fishing, I remember. And I was on the way back from, uh, where I don't even remember where I was at. We were I was driving through Paducah. On the way back to Tennessee, on the way back to Tennessee, and yeah, he fell asleep on the stream, and I had to call him and wake him up. I remember that was hilarious. He started snoring straight at, right there on the live stream, man. It was absolutely one of the funniest <laughs> I, things I ever I saw in my life for over twenty four hours. Oh, I'm well aware, but it was still <laughs> funny. But if I hadn't have called you, you you ended up catching a pretty good sized fish right after that. So if I hadn't have called you, you probably would have lost another rod. Well, it was raining too. I had the heater on. It was it was right at the end of winter. That's the first part of spring. Still a little cold outside. I remember that. I fished, uh, it was Jody's flathead challenge that night. I called it a 20-something pound flathead. Yep. And uh, after the stream, we had caught enough fish to make me be like, eh, well, we're going to stay. We're going to stay all night. Started raining, went, got up in the car, still caught eight more fish after that. And, and they so, caught yeah, a couple was, of Z's too. Oh yeah, I was tired, man. <laughs> that rain hitting that car was just making the right noise for me to fall asleep. <laughs> for sure. Uh, let's see. Uptown Chrissy Brown. Hello, hello. She says hello to three of us. Uh, hello. Just says hello to everybody else in chat. Uh, Buck Chris. Williams is in here. Bugman's in here. Yes, I I'm not fishing right now, but I I went fishing today and I'll be going again tomorrow. Uh, let's see. Hey, that's one way to do it. Buck said you can always make a windbreak out of a tarp, some wood, and some uh, wing nuts. For sure. I've seen people make makeshift shelters like that. Uh, there's definitely 
something to be said for knowing how to tie knots and keeping little basic supplies like that around to be able to do things like that. But one of the so we've we discussed a little bit about the safety and the comfort of things. Let, let's talk let's talk about let's talk about some of the other stuff. So for me, like I said, bait fish baby, you mentioned it too. You know, uh, fishing these open water situations, the bait's always moving. Uh, they're going to be attracted to certain areas. You mentioned the coves, and I think you and I both can agree that usually the, if they're going to the coves, it's because that water's a little bit warmer because the sun's warmed it up, or maybe because there's a bug hatch or something like that. You know, we are still in the point of the year where there are still bug hatches in certain for certain species. Obviously, they're not as prominent as in the spring and summer, but you do occasionally still get a bug uh, hatch. Um, some of the lakes will have turned over. You know, we live we we fish a lot of the Tennessee River lakes, uh, so they don't usually do a turnover quite as severely as some uh, some non-river fed lakes or natural lakes rather. So the thermal climb is not quite uh, as prominent as you'd see. So the bay fish don't really follow that as much in our case, but. I think you and I can both agree it's definitely the temperatures are definitely a major player when it comes to bayfish movement, whether it be worn up from the sun or uh, power water discharge from any of the power plants. Oh, yeah. or I mean, during the winter, if the turbines aren't moving and they're not flowing water, good luck catching anything. And that's another thing, too. I mean, the flowing water part, you know, in the summer, we always talk about the same thing. If the water's not flowing, then you know you might as well just stay home. But it all boils down to the fact that, that movement makes the bait move, and then being able to have that predictability will put you on more fish flat out. It, 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 even if it's just putting you in the vicinity, you're still gonna up your chances. And then, like you said, also you talked about uh, not staying in one spot, about covering water. I mean, that's again, that's a major play. You see a lot of people, especially cat fishermen down here, or even walleye fishermen, they do a lot more. You do a lot more trolling down here in the winter, trolling, drifting, dragging, whatever you want to call it. You know, every every variance of that technique of just covering water is a lot more productive in the winter. And I'm not saying it's not productive in the summer. Obviously, you know, the warmer water months, the fish are more active. You still do it, but. Typically speaking, I would I would say that anchor fishing is more effective in the summer than it is in the winter, simply because the fish are more likely to be actively moving in the summer. You know, there's something to be said for having multiple spots to fish in the winter and only putting so much time in each spot, because obviously if the fish aren't there, they're not there. Whether it be the bait's not there and they're not following it, or whether it be something else entirely for the re- for there to be a reason where the fish are not there. You're better off covering either cover more water or as it like says a bank fish be hitting more spots because the fish are either gonna be there or they're not. And uh I mean that's the way I look at it anyway. I'm I'm I am i am assuming you and I are fairly much pretty much on the same page with that, Zach. Yeah, you got anything I mean, else to add to that? Why, that's why I went ahead and got me a dry suit for the kayak a couple of years ago because I wanted to be able to move. I didn't want to just be stuck at one spot on the bank. I don't fish on the kayak at night during the winter. I will during the summer, not at night during the winter. But I just wanted that ability to move, to cover that water, because I know during the winter, these fish are going to be hunkered down, and getting one to come up and move is hard to do, almost impossible. If those fish aren't already there where you're fishing at, you're more than likely not going to catch anything. Exactly. You and I are 100% on the same page on that for sure. And, and you know, it's going to be something to take into consideration also is the fact that, like you said, in the, in the night, the, the, just, the, just the patterns are different, you know. In the really heat, the really hot, hot part of the year in the summer, obviously night fishing tends to be a little better for certain species. And that goes, and it's, it's literally, I know you talk a lot more from the catfish perspective because it's your favorite. And it's what you got the most experience in, probably, if I had to guess at this point. Believe it or um, not, no. What is it still bass fishing? Still the most experience you got? Yeah. Okay. So, but even bass fishing, typically speaking, people are fishing more for those in the evening and at night, yep. in the summer, even too. Just be just, and just because the bait's just as much as active at night as they are during the day. You know, typically in the winter, you have that sun really fuels that bait, and that make and that makes a big difference. Like I said, your active fish are still going to chase bait in the winter. And honestly, 
you see it everywhere. All the, all the big YouTubers, they, they talk about it. All the big guide fishermen, they talk about it. If you can find bait, you may not catch as many fish, but if you're catching those active fish, you're, you you have just as good of a chance to catch a personal best or some sort of some sort of record of some sort in the winter as you do any other time of the year. Like I said, you may get less bites, but they typically, if you if you're on those active fish, they're going to be quality bites. At least that's been the experience for everybody that I know of. And, and I, I, again, that's again that's it. Speaking of, I don't know if she's in here or not. Skipjack Cindy. Uh, she caught her personal best earlier this week. She it was 50, 50 pound blue cat, I believe she caught, and that's 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 her biggest fish she's ever caught, and she caught just a couple days ago. That is a heck of a fish. Yes, <clears throat> for sure. And she caught it, and it was late in the evening, which is a little you know a little against the the protocol, if you will, in terms of you know night fishing versus day fishing. But she fishes when she can, just like the rest of us. You know, there's some people that are able to have the luxury of picking exactly when they want to go and just going out at peak times this feeding zone, this wind direction, all that stuff. But most of us don't have that luxury. You know, if you, the only way to guarantee yourself to be on fish more often is to get out there and do it. And she's, she's a prime example of what that, what that kind of effort can do to pay off in terms of, you know, bigger fish or just, in, just good fish in general. It's, uh, it was pretty cool. I was, I was actually, I, I, I missed it. I, I went to bed before it happened. So I had to work the next morning, but I was I was really excited for it when I saw it the next morning on Facebook. And I know she's also was. one of those things where you're like, darn, I should have stayed up that extra five minutes. Yeah, I know, right? It literally <laughs> was. Literally, I went to bed and uh when I saw the post on Facebook, it was literally like five minutes later. I was like, Man, you gotta be kidding me. But yeah, you know, it's all just part of it. Oh yeah. Uh Hillbilly Hondo, welcome in, man. Uh again, guys, we are live I, i'm streaming from crystal river florida today bringing you the show as best i possibly can if for some reason there is any kind of lag or issues please let me know but so far it seems to be working pretty good uh, i am currently sitting at taco bell parking lot shout out to taco bell at crystal river for uh feeding me dinner and letting me chill out here dude i kind of want to about right now it, man actually it hit the spot i haven't had it in a hot minute Oh, Tom Chris love- Brown said hello to Butterflies of Sunshine. Butterflies of Sunshine. Good evening to Yak Viking and Chat. Uh, for those who don't know, we're hopping in. Sam is the third voice you hear. He is my other co-host. He does not have a camera tonight, but he is joining us. Yeah, and, uh, I have a headache, so I'm just sitting in a dark room. You, you wouldn't see anything. That's all good. We we are glad you're here and able to make it. Uh, he will be joining us more in the second conversation when we talk about ice fishing on the second hour. Uh, because that is more of his forte when it comes to winter fishing. Uh, because of where he lives, he isn't up the northern, up n- in the northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan. That's a mouthful to say right there. Yeah, northern lower peninsula. Uh, wow, northern lower yeah. Michigan. There we exactly. go. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm listening to you now, I got tongue tied. <laughs> hey. So we talked about we've talked about a little bit about safety. Obviously, there's other considerations to take into account. We've talked about bait fish movement. Uh, let while we're on the topic of bait, let's talk about some of the other baits you can use in the winter. You know, a lot of people, especially carp and catfish anglers, uh, switch to uh, oily meat-based stuff. Like I, I've I've done well. I've even won a tournament using spam in the winter. Um, you'll see a lot of carp fishermen will use like slim jims. Or in the UK, they have a brand that's made, I guess it's made out of donkey meat or something. It's called pepperoni. Uh, but it's it's an oily pepperoni meat stick type stuff. Uh, I don't I don't think I could ever use a Slim Jim fishing just because I would eat the Slim Jims. What? So I tried I it be, for camel cats once, and I didn't catch anything. I did not get any bites last time I tried it. But the Spam, like I said, I, I caught, I've caught fish on it pretty much every time I've used it. Um, the trick is keeping it on the hook, obviously. But for me, I just do a hair rig off of a circle hook. Like, you know, hair rig I can use for carp fishing where there's that little bit of loop of line past the eye going towards the point of the hook. And then just putting the spam on there, cutting a big enough piece so it's actually kind of resting against the hook but not actually on the hook. Um, that way I can get my long cast without ripping it off during the cast. 
It, this might be a dumb question, but I'm not used to that kind of fishing, just given my location. Now, if you use your spam and kind of like pre-bait your hook on a, whatever, like a treble hook or tri hook, and you freeze it, just kind of like, would that rip off as fast or as easy? So if it's if you, if you were pre-tying a rig, yes, you definitely could freeze it. Um, the issue with freezing it, I don't know 100%, sure, I'm not 100% sure that this is the case. But I have seen some other baits where people try to freeze them, and they tend to be more buoyant. Not necessarily float like an ice cube, but they're not necessarily where you want them when you do that until it thaws, right? Which, if you're using, you know, a longer leader, that might be a problem. If you, but if you're doing that and you have an issue, that obviously you can use a shorter leader. Um, but what I do, especially in the winter, because usually wind's blowing, I usually cut it up early, like right before I start setting up all the rods, and give it a couple minutes out in the air. And it'll develop a skin. Like if you ever had a pack of bologna or a pack of hot dogs in the fridge, it's, it's not, you didn't put it in a Ziploc, you just open it and let it sit on the shelf in there. You know, it gets kind of a, a film on the outside. It's yeah, not bad. it's not satisfying kind of thing. Yeah, right, yeah. So that, yeah. That, <laughs> tends, it, that tends to toughen it up a little bit and keep it on your hair rig or whatever, whatnot better. Um, I've done that with frozen skipjack before that was wanting to turn to mush. Set it out Let it sit out and dry out a little bit. Yeah. And it thickens that skin up. I mean, granted, I didn't catch anything on it, but it, it, it helped it stay on the hook. It did. Uh, Mrs. <laughs> Amanda asked, hey, did we use Slim Jims when we all went fishing that one time? I'm not sure which trip you're talking about, but I don't remember personally using any Slim Jims on a trip. Yes. Yes, we did. And we didn't catch anything. Okay. I'll take your word for it. Uh, Fishing Fever, welcome in. So, Buck Williams, I have personally caught pike with a hot dog through the ice. Um, I was using a crappie rig, so I was using two hooks. The bottom hook had a hot dog on it, and the top hook had a gummy worm on it. That is that is interesting for sure. I caught Sorry. pike I off from both of those. <laughs> Well, I caught, caught pike on both of it, so I mean, I've, I've caught catfish off hot dogs. I've caught catfish off spam. I've caught obviously catching <laughs> chicken liver. So, like, and it, what, what reason? The reason I bring this up: these other baits. So the best thing, the well, watch is the best thing. One of the best qualities of these kind of baits is the higher scent dispersion. Right, mm -hmm. you're still putting the bait out in the water because of the oils, because of the scents, the spices, whatever. It puts a lot of scent in the water. So you're not putting a lot of food per se out there, but you're putting a lot of scent out there. And especially if you're fishing like rivers, that, that could be the difference between a whole bag of fish or no fish. Just the idea that with that much scent going out and going downstream, you're giving that trail to that single bait. You know, in the summer, we tend to fish with a lot of extra pieces or throw out the gut packs or, you know, rebate the hook a lot or whatever, right? In the winter, those baits tend to bleed out slower and whatnot, so that scent lasts longer when you have that much in it. And then, obviously, if you're using a bloody bait, the blood tends to bleed out of the bait slower, so that lasts longer. So we don't, we don't, at least I don't anyway. I don't change my baits as much in the winter either. You know, I might change, might keep a bait out there for, you know, in the summer I might do 30 minutes tops or even on some days if I'm fishing for carp and I'm using pack bait or something, I might only go 15, 20 minutes before I'm adding a new reel in, adding more and casting it back out. Whereas in the winter, I can wait anywhere between an hour or even two hours, depending on if it's a headpiece or a body section, if I'm using cut bait. Because obviously the headpiece holds in more blood longer. You know, yeah, well, but, essentially, like, yeah. what the current stuff like that, what you do, um, described is basically almost like a chum line. Right, yeah. exactly. And I, and obviously some states allow chumming and some states don't. Mine does not. But, right. So in the terms of like pack bait and stuff, you have to be a lot more careful and you can't pre-bait way before your trip started. But like you said, doing the chum line, that can be done in any state. As long as your state allows cut bait, you can do the whole, the, the essentially a chumming technique, but it's just a, a that day of type situation as opposed to, you know, days or weeks in advance. Yeah, uh, my uh, Michigan doesn't allow chumming, but you know, I went to uh, Florida Keys and we were fishing there. And the first like first day we went fishing, the uh, we went out to a bait store because that's just what you do, and we bought twelve blocks of uh, chum. Right. Which, 
we weren't thinking it was 110 degrees outside, so it was a race to get home. But oof, oof. <laughs> that sounds awful. That's almost yeah. as bad as my kids unplugging my deep freeze with a hundred plus skipjack in it. Ooh. Buck Williams says it's only illegal if you get caught. No, it is always illegal. You just don't get in trouble if you if you get unless you get caught. You'll always get caught there. eventually. That's also a fact. That is also a fact for sure. So, I mean, so we've talked about safety. We've talked about some varieties of different baits, uh, what you can do with your regular baits, how it changes the way you do things. Um, let's talk about another thing that is not commonly thought about, but weather. So, obviously, you get you get these cold fronts coming through, but you still get rain in the winter. But I don't know about you guys. We're at, we're at here in Tennessee. Well, we're not right now in Florida, but at home in Tennessee, uh, we tend to get – random warm rains in the winter and we get a couple of days of warm weather from it too right stuff like that can also change everything it changes the way the baits go on it can change how lethargic the fish are it can change what baits do better again because of the whole bait thing obviously if you have a really warm rain that bait can go straight into that shallow water and take advantage of that heat uh it's also going to take advantage of any food that's washed into the lake uh you're all of a sudden your worms uh, night crawler, I'm sorry, wor- yeah, red worms, night crawlers, crickets, bugs, stuff like that are going to be more effective baits wise because they're all of a sudden there's more of them in the water all of a sudden. Um, depending on how early or how late into the winter, like how close it is the spring, uh, you can get all of a sudden the crawfish and the, or the frogs will start coming back out of the mud, you know, for a little bit, uh, get kind of a false indication of spring or fall for them. So they get, they'll come out. And all of a sudden, those baits are active again. I mean, I don't know about you guys. Like I said, I, we see it a lot here in Tennessee with the, the, the rain being able to affect things. And But the thing to keep in mind with that, if you're getting the rain right off the bat, the rain's in direct contact with the water and mixing with that water, you'll see that temperature change, temperature change happen a lot faster than you will with just a couple of days of warm weather. I'm sure I'm sure Sam and Zach can test uh, go with me on this too. If, if you have three days of warm weather, well, really the the fishing is not going to get better or change much until the second or third day. That first day yeah. may not do jack squat, but if it's well, it kind of depends on the time of year up here, honestly. Because yeah, if fair. it's uh, seventy degrees and then overnight it turns ninety degrees, like the fish don't know really what what the heck is going on. It's yeah. Right, but by the second or third day of it being ninety, all of a sudden it's going to change and shift in a direction that you can you can gauge and predict off of, right? Yeah, mostly. And, and whereas, like I said, if you have a, a, a the rain, especially if the rain's in there mixing that water, that change is going to happen almost immediately, with even a, even within a couple of hours, and you can see the fish start to change their mind depending on that. On, on that, what that temperature change is and how, how strong it and is. And if that change starts to happen, say like you're in the middle of fishing and that change starts to happen, it's going to, it can shut your fish down. For sure. And then all of a sudden you're not catching anything where you were nailing fish and the bite just dies. Or it could do a 180 too. Yeah. And it could amp it back up again. It's just, it all depends. And yes, Amanda, in summary, changing your baits, what kind of use during each season can make a difference. And yes, there are people who will only use certain techniques and certain baits in certain times of the year because of that. And I won't lie, I'm one of those people. There are certain techniques I will not use in the wintertime. Let's say I'm, I'm, especially from a bank fishing perspective, if I'm fishing in the winter, I don't usually sit in one spot for forever unless I'm getting bites. If I'm there for more than an hour without getting bites, I'm moving to another spot. Whereas in the summer, I might sit in the same spot for eight or nine hours because I know at any minute there could be a school of fish move in. And that's that's what you see a lot during the winter. That's why some of these guys aren't catching any fish during the wintertime, especially like your take home and eat guys because they sit in one spot eight or nine hours and there's no fish moving through because the fish are not moving right so i know this is a little bit on the ice fishing but uh my father-in-law what he used to do when he was younger had more energy um 
is you're allowed three lines and one of the ice fishing techniques that we use is called a tip up it's basically just a pole that releases a flag once a bail takes a uh, drag he would just set up three and by the first time or by the time that his third um um tip up was in the water he would just move like leapfrog because there was no fish there So now you've got live scope and everything like that. Some of these other guys are using on the ice to see if there are fish there, which helps a lot. Well, for it sure. Cause I mean, even, you know, even for another example down here, I'm, I'm going to been fishing with a guy who does a lot of charter fishing trips, but he, you know, he himself isn't charter, but he goes on a lot of charter fishing trips, but even just the fishing down here, if you know, you go to a boat launch and there's not a lot of boats there or a lot, not a lot of charter captains there. There's a reason they're not there, you know? So yeah, they do yeah you, might, you, but so you get a little more peace and quiet sitting there, obviously, because there's nobody else there, but there's, you're probably not going to catch any fish there, or at least your chances aren't as high. I mean, obviously you, you can catch fish in a mud puddle depending on the time of year and how it got there, but it's, it's not as likely as it would be going to somewhere where you know the fish are at, or you know somebody else knows the fish are at. Just because you've had information on the inside, and then Sorry, I had to handle an issue. <laughs> oh, you're good, man. Uh, so again, touch safety, touch bait types, uh, bait changes, bait patterns. Let's talk about techniques some more. You know, so like I said, for me, I don't anchor fish as much in the winter, just because. I mean, I do, but I don't do it for long periods of time because obviously the fish are there or they're not. Um, but when it comes to covering water, I mean, you know, we obviously, depending on the technique, you said you go for a certain speed, you go for a certain distance, you go for, depending on the wind pattern or whatnot, that can change your angle of attack or where you actually, actually do the, you know, drifting or dragging from, but even your techniques have to change slightly. I mean, if you, if you're throwing artificials. Again, studying bait fish behavior, yeah, they might be moving, but they're they're definitely more lethargic. Uh, they're not as skittery or jittery, I guess is a better word probably for it. Um, if you do have a shad a shad kill, you know you have a lot of uh, bait uh, shad bait that's going to be just barely moving and then kind of sinking for a while and then barely moving sink for a while, or even just floating depending on what 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 kills them basically or how they die. And the time of year. So even keeping that in mind, your techniques have to change slightly too. You know, you might, in the summer, you might reel a bait in as absolutely fast as possible for things. But in the, in the, in the winter, you know, you want to crank it basically as slow as possible. Basically lose your sanity fishing it so slow. Um, I think a lot of people don't take that into consideration either. I mean, you got, you got any, uh, you got any words to go on that one, Zach? I slow down a lot, especially if I'm dragging in the winter. Like, uh, now if I'm bank fishing, I will not use the Santee. Because in my brain, them fish are hugging that bottom when they're moving. They're not Makes up sense. in the water column where they normally are. So sense, maybe my leader, instead of being like 14 to 16 inches, is only about 10 to 12 inches. That That makes a difference. And when I'm dragging baits, I shorten my leader down too, where that bait's not coming that high off the bottom. Uh, because no matter what I do, I do not drag a Carolina rig. I get them hung up too much. I drag a Santee. My Santee rig may only be 16 inches long during the winter. It's a shorter rig. And that just keeps it closer to the bottom and keeps it from hanging up. It still allows it when it pops over uh structure it still kicks that bait up where it doesn't uh hang it into the structure sure and, and sam i know like i said i know you you don't do as much open water fishing in the winter but you know i know you know people that fish for salmon and uh trout and stuff in the rivers up there and in the great lakes even before the ice freezes over on the great lakes and uh, I, i'm assuming they change their techniques as well you want to go touch it on that a little bit from what you know from your friends and stuff um yeah so normally salmon and trout they're hard to pin down in the winter honestly it depends on the water temperature like this year i know 
people were out there in kayaks uh, because it's been exceptionally warm. Like a couple of weeks ago, we had 55, 60 degree weather. So there's no ice on the water right now. Normally we have about 12 inches on the smaller lakes. Um, but I've been perch fishing before and pull up a 12 pound brown trout, um, which are like out of 20 feet of water. And I believe my buddy, he was just curious and he went down rigging uh, looking for a trout or salmon. And he caught one like a hundred feet deep in uh, Lake Michigan might've been even 125. Wow. Uh, but he was just curious just because, you know, uh, this is a weird winter. Uh, but normally they go shallower. They're feeding on the bait or like what you said, or previously the bait fish, uh, perch and, uh, bluegill, things of that nature. Um, so they're in between 20 and 50 feet of water normally. Um, which is really cool looking at like the ice because sometimes ice just, it's like glass, like you see on, um, like YouTube and stuff. So you can just see like these schools of perch, um, and then just instantly they're just gone and you just see like a looming shadow, like in the darkness. It's really kind of cool, that creepy. Was, and I can imagine that would be really cool and creepy for sure. Or uh, I'm sure you see some silver flashes every once in a while for like if it's a coho or Chinook salmon. Oh, a hundred percent. Where you're at, Sam, do they spear uh pike? Yeah, oh yeah. Um there's people do spear. It's a little it's a different ball game because remember uh previously I said you're normally fishing out of um a four to eight inch hole on average. When you spear, you basically you need a chainsaw and uh, you cut out blocks and uh, you um, put up a shanty or it's basically like a pop-up tent. That way it doesn't get uh, too bright. And you put your lure down there. And because you're, um, you're using a chainsaw, you're essentially making a three, four foot square hole. Uh, so it's if you, and keep in mind, this is still ice. So if you slip and fall, um, you know, you got minutes, uh, to dry off or else, you know, um, so it's a lot more dangerous. Even when you leave the ice, it's, uh, you still gotta be responsible for this four foot hole. So you need to bring like an old pine tree. Like a lot of people, um, to bring out like their old Christmas tree and, um, use that to mark their hole but yeah um spearing for um pike and musky are definitely a big thing up here i think they even do it for some walleye because uh, you know that's some of those things can get pretty big up here too especially in uh the saginaw bay it's not uncommon to catch 10 and a half an hour anthony you're at a wrong you're at a weird angle Did he freeze? He mud. What well, well. <laughs> well, everybody, the show's about to go south. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, he's in Florida, so it's already kind of gone there. <laughs> I was just curious. I've always been interested in like the I the ice fishing stuff. It's a new ball game altogether. Like I I like the new technologies that they have now, but at the same time, one of like my favorite things about ice fishing is a guessing game. Cause you don't like the ice is glass maybe for a week and then it gets cloudy, it gets snow covered. Uh, there's different types of ice too, like white ice, which is unreliable at best. That's basically like slush that freezes. So if you ever go ice fishing and you ask somebody like, how's the ice? And they're like, Oh yeah, we got six inches of blue ice, which I mean, if you have like 18 inches of blue ice, you could drive a truck on, but if they go, Oh yeah, we got eight inches of white ice. You will not catch me on that at all. Just because white ice, you that's when people will fall through. Okay. It's always been something that piques my interest. We had a, we had a cold winter a few years back when I was first getting interested in ice fishing. I was, checking a bunch of the ponds and stuff like that around me to see if it froze deep enough. The deepest ice we got was like two inches. And I yeah. No. 
that uh so i've gone and i'm scared to do this especially now uh for the chat i'm a below the knee amputee uh so i'm not sure of my my footing like my steps so like you know yak track or yak track stuff like that but it's still like if i fall in one of my big concerns because i haven't gone swimming yet if i fall in through the ice am i just going to do like a big circle or <laughs> you know, laugh, but I'm a no. person. So seeing you do a circle would be funny. <laughs> but like no like i have like i have a huge like um sense of humor about this thing like when I went into for my uh, amputation, I might have told you the story. Like the lady's like, "So what are you here for?" And my my uh, amputation was almost a year. It'll be a year in February. But I was like, you know, I've never met my New Year's resolution to lose thirty pounds. So I was just hoping you could take the leg off. And uh, yeah, um, so you know, I met my re New Year's resolution for the first time last year, but. Um, but yeah, so, you know, humor is the best medicine in that regard, yeah. but I definitely don't want to be swimming in a giant circle in the ice. Uh, that's, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, next winter, this winter, if you're up for some ice fishing, let me know. I got everything, the sphere and stuff like that too. I've got family up in Michigan. Right now. So. I guess we're waiting on Anthony to get back because and let us get back and try it. Well, does mm -hmm. anybody have any questions right now about what we're talking about? Right. Go ahead and answer some questions. Oh. No, Evan, my house is haunted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if i ever do like a well when i get my webcam and my my computer is broken right now but if i have like a, my webcam up and running and somebody says like oh yeah there's somebody behind you nope i'm out i've seen too many horror movies where that ends instantly bad <laughs> i have enough animals that somebody's gonna alert me if something's going on <laughs> I got, so I have two cats, two dogs, and a bird. Um, but the cats don't, you know, they're cats. I don't care about anything. Um, my One of my dogs is a St. Bernard, and uh, she just sleeps. So yeah, I've got four cats, one dog, a Cotamundi, possum, a bunch of reptiles, fish. I have a zoo, man. Damn. Or dang. Sorry. <laughs> No, I said four dogs and one cat. Oh, my bad. But I mean, we've recent somebody got evicted out here where we're at, and they just left their cat, and he, she was at my door meowing. I know you got food. I can smell it. Oh yeah, it was. I was like, well, you can come in. I can't promise how nice it's going to be in here for you with the dogs, <laughs> but the dogs have left her alone. And of course, it matches my household. Here's that song. <laughs> it's a cute little kitty. Oh, yeah, she's a good girl. Where is Anthony? It might be getting some more tacos too. Could be. He just, he, yeah, he. I'm. It's a conspiracy. He's just using this. Oh, I crashed, and he's no. getting a burrito and some tacos. No, I didn't, Hillbilly. I'll check it out. It could have been our husky. It could have been our our German Shepherd. It could have been something, or it could have been a ghost popping his head in saying hi. Either way, well, it'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Moon's been in there the whole time. 
Oh, okay. oh so there's something really cool about ice fishing. There's like an ice um, fishing event over on Black Lake, Black Lake, um, which is about two hours from where I'm at. But it's called the uh, the Chivalry. But they're they used to have like the ice would be so thick, like they would have Ferris wheels and it's like tip up town is what we'd call it, or Shanty Village. There'd be probably two, three hundred like shanties up there. And you gotta remember too, like every fisherman is allowed uh like three lines in the water. So there's thousands of lines. Nobody catches anything. It's it's mostly a good reason or excuse to drink. But it is it's basically like a fair on the ice. It, it's amazing. I need to come up there that time of year. <laughs> I don't My brother in law I like watching drunk people do stupid stuff on ice. That'd be funny. Well, my brother-in-law, he goes out there and uh, they have like snowmobile races and everything like that as well. Um, but he, his shanty, he like, he camps out there. He has a heater and uh, oh, whatchamacallit. He's got heaters. He's got a stove out there, like bunk beds. The other Avid. voice, Avid, is my conscience. <laughs> I'm the new guy, Avid. Um, my computer broke, and I kind of have a little bit of a headache, so I'm just kind of sitting in a dark room. If I turn on my camera, you really wouldn't see much. Hey, Amanda. What? Text Anthony real quick and see what's up. Thank you. But yeah, we're uh. I'm gonna get her to text him and he might even know he's off. Who knows? <laughs> He'd be talking to himself in the middle of Taco Bell's parking lot. That's how the cops get called right there. Like, all right, yep, uh, we're you're going for a psych exam. I promise, officer, I'm live streaming. <laughs> sure you are. No, I'm a I'm a fisherman from Tennessee. Yep, yep, yep. We're in Florida right now, buddy. I'm really jealous. I'm so badly like I was planning on going to uh, the Keys again this year, but I already took my vacation, so which is why I wasn't here a couple of weeks ago. We need to go to the beach and go shark fishing, dude. That's on my bucket list. Oh, well, I fucked in the shark, but I'm that way, and we'll go. I have spots we can beach eight, nine sharks a night, and it's a given. The size varies, but I mean, it's it's a shark. That's fine. Like, do you ever keep shark, or are they protected there? Uh, I keep them as long as they're in slot limit. Okay. If uh, I'll I'll keep one in slot limit. That's a lot of meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. That's why I was curious. And I know a lot of people don't like the flavor of shark. Like they'd say it tastes either like too fishy or gamey or uh, but. Um, if you so like, I will. I used to be a chef, but if you like, what I always did when I was making Mako steaks was I would soak it in like tomato soup or something like high as not lemon, not, not a citrus acid, but something with a bunch of acid like tomato products, and that took the sharkiness out of it. I am back. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what happened, it, but it, it took you long enough. Well, Tony, I, so you went to go it, get tacos. <laughs> no, so I had it going through my phone for the camera. And Which was not using the webcam on the laptop because the laptop webcam's bad. But then my phone died, so I had to go somewhere else. So I'm having to, yeah, I haven't used the hotspot on the phone. Uh, but hey, seems like it's working okay. Uh, you guys all in chat, I am sorry about that. Hope hope they've been keeping you entertained. I am back. So where are we at, gentlemen? What's the uh, what, what, what what do we move on to? Uh, I was talking about a fair on the ice. Okay. Um, we were talking about shark fishing. Oh yeah, shark fishing. That was the last okay. night. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, so let's uh, you know, for some of it, you, we, the goal of this show is to cover two topics an hour. So, well, hey, you know, we we were talking about winter fishing. So ice fishing is part of winter fishing. You and I have talked about open water winter fishing. 
we do things a little bit different than obviously people fishing ice. Whereas, you know, people out West might do something entirely. People that are fishing mountain creeks or rivers that don't have ice year round, they're going to fish things differently. I know Teleco over here up in the mountains, they, uh, all their bigger trout come out. It's catch and release season, so they get a chance to get big. They're not being harvested nonstop. Um, all that good stuff. So with that being said, uh, I think we can conclude that your baits should change. Well, it can change. It should be considered to be changed, rather, in the winter. Uh, if you're going to do open water fishing, you definitely need to concentrate not only on where the bait are going, but what they're doing and what is available because obviously the things such as weather can change what's available um things such as uh shad kills can change what's available stuff like that and obviously the area you're fishing to like you said you use you tend to use more gizzard shad and bluegill in the winter yep than skipjack you know because and that makes sense skipjack are a little more nomad i'd argue a little more nomadic uh, in the winter, they're kind of hit or miss. Um, they're harder to get a hold. They're harder to get a hold of. If you find them, you find a bunch of them, right? They're in giant schools. They're not. They're not concentrated in any kind of certain area like they are in the spring or in the fall. Um, the gizzard shad, obviously, they move you around anyway. Uh, those are large schools you can find of. Find fairly easy. Um, your bluegills are going to act differently. Your perch are going to act differently in the winter. But again, they're following when that bait as well. Um, and your tactics got to change. You know, obviously, cover more waters be more beneficial. Slowing down your presentation is be more beneficial because it matches the hatch better. And 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 some of the, one thing we didn't cover so much, but just kind of a I guess a common thing that's tossed around is downsizing your baits will tend to put more fish in the boat around the bank for you in the winter too. Um, I, I do downsize my bait, but down or change it from skipjack to shad or brim. That's an automatic downsize too. Typically, yeah. Um, I'll but be even right if back, Anthony. you're good, but even if you're even if you're using the same bait, just downsizing a smaller piece can put more fish in the bait uh, in the on the bank or in the boat for you. With that being said, though, uh, we're gonna go ahead and shift into a Q and A. Does anybody in the crowd that's watching have any questions for us when it comes to open water, uh, freshwater fishing in the winter? Before we shift on to the second topic, which is ice fishing. If you do have any, we're welcome to. You're welcome to put it out there. We'll happily talk about it. Uh, for those who are still tuning in, appreciate you guys. Uh, it's been, it's been fun. I, I'm, you know, this, this new setup for the podcast, almost like a rebranding, rather. You know, what I was doing the Yak and Yak Fishing podcast. I did that series on beginner fishing. Um, but having the co-host, having you guys doing it on Saturday night, supposed to Saturday mornings. Uh, it's worked a lot better for me doing it every other week also works better for my schedule. Uh, I feel like it's going to, it's going to be good, more consistent, more topics, more opinions. It's it's all going to be good. Um, I do think it'll be good. Uh, Avid, if you're talking about my first fish trip of the year, it, it was very slow. I, uh, went car fishing and caught one fish. If you are talking about, he was asking about my first fishing, or how was my first fishing trip. Uh, if you talk about the first trip in Florida, which was today, it was good. Went out with Mrs. Yak and Baby Yak uh, for about six hours today. Uh, Mrs. Yak caught four redfish uh, and three black drum. I caught two redfish, three black drum, and a trout. So it's uh it's been fun, it's different, and I'm going out again tomorrow. Uh, I think it's just gonna be just me and Eric tomorrow. So I think we're gonna try to maybe get on some some further backwater sections that are a little further away from the boat launch. It might be a little sketchier to get back there since the baby won't be on board with us. And see if we can get on some bigger redfish, but we shall see. Uh so keep an eye out on the channel for those videos when they come out. Um but yeah, all right, well, if there is no other questions, uh, we'll go ahead and shift on to the second topic. Uh, for those who are just tuning in, we just got done talking about the, I call it the winter fishing mindset. You know, it's just things to consider and change uh, your tactics in order to get onto more fish in the winter. Avid, yes, there was a game warden encounter today. Uh, 
they were out there checking everybody. There was we got checked out on the water, got boarded, and then there was also another one at the launch as well. They were definitely out there busting people today for sure. Uh, Hillbilly Hondo, take care, stay warm. Yes, sir. You too. Thanks for tuning in. But yeah, so uh, before we keep going on any further, we are going to take a one little minute break just to get everybody back into place, give us a chance to get some water and whatnot. So we will be back in just a moment. Until then, feel free to check out this intro video. We will be right back. Grab your rods and tackle box, folks, as we dive into the wild world of fishing. Get ready for some laughs, some fish stories, and a touch of chaos as we wade into the deep waters of fishing wisdom. Our guides on this trip are a know-it-all, a guy who desperately needs a haircut, and a man named Sam. In this podcast, this Molly crew shares their knowledge, their latest fishing antics, and probably get into more trouble than they bargained for. It's a podcast as unpredictable as the sport of fishing. If you love fishing, then this is the place to be, because in this podcast, every catch is a big one. Every story is a keeper, and the only thing more legendary than the tales is the trio delivering them. Welcome to the Bait Tank. All right, y'all, welcome back to the second part of the Bait Tank Fishing Live Video Podcast. My name is Anthony. I'm your host, and joining me are Zach from Cabbage Viking and Sam the Pirate from Sam's Amputee Out uh, Adventures. Uh, welcome in again, guys. For everybody, stay tuned for the first hour. We were talking about fishing in winter, uh, mostly op- concentrating on open water, uh, but in concentrating on things such as changing baits, changing tactics, just some things to consider to get stuff on more fish in the winter. Uh, now we're shifting to ice fishing, which I know Zach uh, will not have as much input on this one. He's definitely got a desire to try it out, but he does not hate ice in Alabama. I do not get ice in Tennessee. I did used to ice fish as a kid, and I watch it a lot and read a lot about it because it still interests me. Uh, I do have some funny stories about ice fishing, but Sam is definitely going to be the highlight of this hour while we talk about ice fishing. And he's already touched on a couple of things, you know. In, in Michigan in particular, you know, they're, they're only allowed to use three lines. So the idea is similar like you would do for catfishing or carp fishing anywhere else in open water. You spread those baits out as far as you can, uh, reasonably or legally, depending on the situation and state you're in, and try to cover as much water as possible. But the mindset when it comes to ice fishing is just a tad bit different. Uh, the fish act a little bit differently when there's not any wind altering the uh, currents or anything like that. There's also a difference. And I'm sure you'll go into that as well, where the weather doesn't affect it as much because unless it's actually penetrating the ice and getting into that bottom layer of water, uh, it's almost like a cushion from the water to the outside air. So the weather fluctuations in those situations are not as severe. So uh, Sam, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us kind of a brief uh, summary of what ice fishing is and then maybe we'll we'll break down into it a little further, such as some certain tactics or certain tools you can use while you're ice fishing to uh, be more successful. Sure, I can definitely do that. Um, Just let you know, my headset did die for some reason, so I'm just using my phone as a phone. So if there's an audio issue, just let me know. Um, You sound so good so far. I think you're probably having more of a signal issue on my end at this point because now I'm doing what i can signal wise but it is fluctuating unfortunately so we'll just roll with it you still there sam sam yeah hello yeah we can hear you okay go ahead go ahead and tell us a All brief right. summary about ice fishing all right, so ice fishing is one of the most miserable, fun times you can have. I mean, it's 20 degrees on a warm day. Uh, you normally have to walk uh, like a quarter mile to a half a mile out on the ice to get into where the fish are. Um, every once in a while, you can get lucky and only have to like walk a few hundred feet off from shore, um, where like a shelf or something. 
Um, but it's one of the best, best times ever because it just brings everybody real close. You can kind of have like a campfire situation with no fire. Um, everybody is just circled and just, you know, having a beer on the ice, telling fishing or hunting tails, uh, anything outside and, you know, friendly picking on each other. So it definitely becomes more of a sit and wait game and ice fishing as opposed to uh, covering water in open water situations. Yeah, there I can count how many like on my hand how many times and he cut out again. It's probably me. I it's probably heard me. You. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, all right. So maybe it is him. Uh yeah, you know, like I said, he's living in the northern part of Michigan. They've had snow for the last three days, so he's going to cut in and out probably because of weather there too. Um, but we'll see. We'll we'll get him when he comes back in. But the uh, All right, can you hear me now? You can. Yeah. All, all right. right. Try again. All right. So sorry about that. Yeah. So um, I can't fire without fire. Yeah, uh, it's just it is a hurry up. Or like it's it is a weight game. Um. There's been only a handful of times where I can think of where it there's really no talking. Uh, as soon as you put your line down, there's a perch on your line, and perch up here is they're they're just fun to catch. I mean, you're only looking at like 12 inches for a big like big perch, but they're just fun to catch, and you you're allowed 25 to, um, that you can take home. Well, I just remember them being fatter in the winter for sure. Oh yeah, they're you, chunky you boys one, in the winter. So you catch one that you might catch one that's eight inches long, but still weigh a pound. You know, uh, for those who don't know, yellow perch are very slender, skinny fish. Typically, they're lo- they're usually longer than they are tall. Yeah, but they do. They get fat in the winter. They uh, we have we have yellow perch here in the Tennessee. This yeah, they're exactly they're exactly the same, but yeah, they're typically smaller and they're definitely leaner. Uh, yeah, than they are up north for sure. But. Yeah, and they for some reason, like in the summertime, I tend to catch more like eight, nine inch perch, which are still, you know, I'll keep those. Um, none to snub your nose at, and it's still a good perch. But in the winter time, like you catch 14, 15 inch perch, and you can catch, um, I've seen nine of those be brought up in an hour before and normally you might see one in a week in the summertime right so, so well you also there, mentioned another good point you you uh you still have to take lake topography into consideration when you do it is, is so much it's free where you actually set up your holes at right yeah um i mean there's technology now where you can kind of see like the bottom and where the fish activity are um I know Zach was um, mentioned that earlier, um, but that's kind of newer within the last probably five, eight years. Well, sure. Um, for, an aver- for an average person trying to get into ice fishing, the biggest thing is just topography, and you, you still treat it most for the most part. At least from what I can remember, you you treat it the same as you would fishing out in a boat. Oh, hundred percent. You just you want to go instead of shallow waters, and I, don't get me wrong, they'll still run shallow, but few very few and far between uh, it's like a blue moon um so just go on the deeper end and settle the shallower end and just wait and when you say deeper end, you're talking about transitions such as what ledges and points yeah on the ledges instead of like if you have the option to go deeper or shallow go deep and then uh, the other thing i distinctly remember fish behavior being different you know when in open water situations you'll get some schooling fish but typically they're, they're a little more spread out i distinctly remember when i was ice fishing you could sit there and like you said all of a sudden catch 15 within a very short time frame and then catch nothing the rest of the day just because they seem to school in bigger yeah. schools in under the ice for whatever reason so it depends on the fish and the time of day um so I found like walleye kind of group up more in the evening time. Like I always call it the sharking hour. Uh, just, just the when sharks, hour. yeah. Oh, okay. Like the yeah. hour before it does or before it gets dark. I found like walleye will definitely group up more. That's when you catch like five or six, like at one time. Um, but during the day, like high noon, one o'clock, you might get 
it, it's miserable because it does it, it feels like no matter what you do you're not going to get a bite um sure. i kind of found a way to um so pike they're they're not picky at all like i mentioned earlier i caught one on a hot dog um but i found well, he cut out again, disconnected entirely. I'm sure you're back. But, you know, I, he, he was saying your tactics change, schooling behavior changes, and it, it is it's different. And he'll get back. When he comes back, we'll talk about it more as well. But there's different techniques you do just specifically for ice fishing that you can't do in open water. Uh, and and they, they definitely could be a lot of fun. Uh, let's talk about some comments from the chat while we're waiting for him to come back. Chrissy Brown said, let's see, the ice would crack and pop and I would lose all bodily functions. My heart might even stop, she said. <laughs> I, I don't I know how I'm going to react my first time ever being on ice. I want to go, but I just don't know how I'm going to right. react. Is that, I've, heard, I've heard it still cracks with you on it. It's it safe, can. but it's, it can still crack. Sure. Sam, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can. Welcome back. So what you Thanks. were saying, do you remember what you were saying? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. shoot. Uh, what was the last Char you heard me? Shark, sharking hour, walleye, catch a five or six at a time. Uh, the schooling okay. behavior being different. Um, during like noon, three, uh, noon to that sharking hour, that sweet time you might only get like one fish or one bite an hour and it's fish grab the bait and run. They don't actually like bite. It, it takes them a couple of seconds. So just because you get that bite doesn't mean anything. There's a very, very high chance, actually um, annoyingly high chance that you're just going to rip the, the bait out and uh, just give the fish a free meal. I got gotcha. you. So one thing I was talking to them about when you got, when you left, um, there's certain techniques you don't, you do that are more prominent from fishing the ice. And, uh, I, I know specifically two the big ones are going to be jigging, uh, and then dead sticking and then tip upping. And that's not including spear fishing, which is a whole other thing. We'll get into that later. We can get into that a little bit more because it's some pretty, it's a pretty crazy spectrum of difference between spear fishing and fishing through a hole yeah uh, so obviously with the jigging it's very similar to open water jigging in terms of like jigging spoons or jigging off the bottom but it's so, definitely straight vertical as opposed to horizontal yep and what and this is gonna sound really weird so my favorite jigging in the winter time and i've just done this through like the last two years so it's a rather recent thing i've been ice fishing for 20. um it's a lipless crankbait and I cut I have, the. I have heard of people doing that. And I am annoyingly loud. Like I'll be fishing ten feet of water, um, which crooked lake. Like I said, that's where I mainly fish. It's a very shallow lake. It only gets, I think, like twenty feet, maybe, um, at its steepest point. But I'll be. I've heard my rattle like in my shanty through the ice, like eight feet deep. Just I'm that annoyingly loud with it. And I've wow. caught fifteen pike within four hours so would you say that's more of a predatory like a aggressive predatory fish technique i mean do you catch walleye doing that i mean i'm sure yep you I, so too, it's but. definitely a predatory fish uh, the only fish i've caught doing that is i've hooked into a muskie once um and i wasn't prepared for that Sure. I was only running eight pound tests, which is still rather thick for ice fishing. Normally people run like four um, when they're catching perch. But yeah, so I could see how long it was and I could see those, um, the coloring and you know, there's only one fish that really looks like that. Um, right. Yeah. But I cooked into one of those and it's just been walleye and pike with that, both the lipless. Um, if you want perch, uh, bluegill, crappie, uh, those types of fish. Um, my go-to is always a Swedish pimple with a, a blue minnow. For those who don't know, a Swedish pimple is a spoon. Uh, it's a it's definitely a bait you find up north, and you it's not something they sell down south. Uh, no, um, at all. It, so it's not a typical spoon like most spoons that you know. It has like that a spoon um, has that hollow side, 
this right. is just solid. It has a shape of a spoon. It just make doesn't make the spoon motion. Um, but and I've seen them actually like with the I have a um a camera that I can put in the ice um in the winter time. It's kind of neat, and I found it at a yard sale for fifteen bucks, and it keeps me entertained. Okay. Um, but it the Swedish pimple action. It I don't see. It's one of those bait like whenever i get a fish it, it's a head scratch i'm like i would not it doesn't look like nothing in nature sure so it, it kind of makes you think like why would you even bite at this yeah but you know i'm not going to complain it works i often Although, ask the same thing when i'm staring at a piece of cake on the counter like why would i eat that but smells <laughs> But, you know, so, like you said, techniques are different. Yes, it, it is quite common to use lighter line, especially for the smaller fish species. Because, uh, believe it or not, even though there's a giant layer of ice on top, light does penetrate it, especially if there's no snow on top. And uh, fish can see that stuff. And if your fish is so steadily slow and those fish are moving so slow, your, your presentation can be... A deal breaker for sure. If you're using thick, too thick a line, or, um, or like if you're using braid, if you're using something that's colored, stuff like that, you you can easily spook the fish. So yeah, I, I it actually kind of penetrates the line a little bit more than normal because it's like a laser beam because it's sure. a narrow. Yeah, right. Because you're having that one little, really bright hot spot on the hole that you're fishing, and just straight down. There's a I can see that entirely. It makes total sense. Yeah. See, I, I was wondering that because. My thought, the ice is so thick, and then you add snow or something on top of it, how can the fish know it's day or night? They still do, I can assure you. I, they they definitely do, and I have wondered that for a while. Like, I can understand when there isn't that much ice, because um, the first week um, on an average winter that like, you can go ice fishing, and there's only like four or five inches of ice. So that's when you get that crystal glass look. Um, but the rest, as soon as you get snow cover, I'm like, how can you tell? Like, I'm, I'm always paranoid. Like, I'm my holes. Like, like the fish are gonna know there's a line there just because there's gonna be sun. There's no other place where sun can go except for right here. So yeah. I always kind of, you know, make like wherever the sun is, I'll put like a shit. Like I'll cover all my uh, ice and snow from my hole and I'll put it on that one side. Um, just because I'm paranoid. I know it's one of those things where I know I'm thinking too much in it, but it always, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. See, I, uh, over, I, have, a, I have a problem overthinking things. That's that's what I feel like I'd be doing with ice fishing because I'd be like, okay, well, they don't know it's day or night. I should use a bait with a lot of scent, something like that, something not very visual, but instead I need to be doing the opposite because they know. Yeah. Um. Uh, Another thing you talk about, you know, the whole, the light being an issue, that's where people start using the shanties and stuff, too. The idea is you're covering the hole. But and, but then you also got to think about, like I said, okay, all of a sudden I've made this 12 by 12 square of darkness. You know, are the fish going to notice that, right? 12 by 12, man, you're that's the Ritz. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it, just the, um, the idea that you made this block and all of a sudden there's no light when there was light. That actually kind of like that makes more sense to me because you know it's dark. The only real light is um a lot of the shanties like mine has a couple of plastic windows. Now I just sure. have like a pop up um shanty. It's kind of like um a sled like a, a sled on the bottom, and you just fold it over and you put a couple of poles in, and well, boom, there's a tent. Um, right. but really the only light is four plastic windows, which doesn't give too much light and a buddy heater. I got you. Well, then, you know, you can... so some more stuff you talk about. You talk about you find that camera that you can look under the water and see what the lake looks like. Uh, why don't you talk a little about how flashers work? For those who don't know, flashers are a type of fish finder, uh, specifically made for ice fishing. Do you want to explain how that concept works and whether or not you use one yourself? I I do not use one. Um, I know a lot of people that do, and basically, it just you can see the bottom of um, the lake and that just kind of shows like any anything above the bottom uh, and it could be like two inches off the bottom. These things are so sensitive. You could have 
what was it? We did a quarter ounce um, bell sinker and it could it show tell. Up? Yeah, it, it showed up. Wow. It was, I'm like, it was almost really? like um, hunting and somebody like basically like those high rent, like, and I'm for people that do this, but basically it felt like almost like shooting somebody's pet. Like it was so easy. Like there was no guessing out of it. And it got right. to the point where he was like, well, there's no fish here. And he'd move six feet, drill another hole, put the thing in. And he's like, eh, there's two there. And sure enough, he'd pull two, wait five minutes, nothing. Move 10 more feet in there. But, oh, yep, there's one here. I'm like, the force is strong with him. Well, like, just covering water, I guess. But uh, drilling holes gets tiring. I mean, if you have one of those, I don't know about you. We used to, we always had an ice spud. We didn't even have an auger. So we used to there, you were chiseling a hole. That makes for a long day. That makes you not yeah. want to move. <laughs> no, I, was, I, I just think there my dad, like, you know, I couldn't do, I was little, so I wasn't able to really help him. I remember my dad chipping away these holes and we'd have, you know, one for me, one for my brother, one for him. Or if we had our uncle, then one for him. So, you know, three or four holes, that's it. And dad might do an extra hole for a tip up, but typically it was just all of us sitting on a bucket with our little jigging pole waiting. And he, he had a flasher he would use sometimes, but usually we weren't using one either. And I remember watching that and seeing a fish go by and going, oh, hey, there it is. And But I distinctly remember, it, like you said, they're so sensitive. If you think about it, a quarter-ounce dumbbell sinker, like you said, is going to be a very, very small surface area for anything to read because it reads vertical up and down, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you might use a 32nd or 64th ounce jig head, but once you put that on there and have the bait and everything on it, it's going to have a wider profile. So that's why those things can still show up even. Yep. It's just amazing insane. how, like, fine tune those things where it's like wow for sure uh wolves den welcome in man we're talking about ice fishing right now uh you got sam up here sam lives in northern michigan uh he's kind of uh, out of the three of us he's the ice fishing expert uh i i know i know a limited amount from when i fished up in ice in the ice as a kid uh but obviously when i moved to tennessee that all went away uh other than me seeing on tv and watching youtube and reading articles and stuff uh, on the subject of tip ups, you said specifically they are a essentially a bite alarm, but it's just a flag. Yep. When the when the reel goes off, now why don't you explain a little about what they are? It's because it's not a typical rod and reel. It's literally just a spool on a on a crossbar stick. Am I, am yeah. I wrong? Nope, you're you're right. And there's on the uh, on the stick the bales and the water because you don't want it to freeze um which is always cool because when you're reeling in a fish you don't actually reel the fish you basically you you hand reel it um and the tip up is laying on the ground so you, you when you're bringing this fish up you have to be mindful of where your bale is where your tip up is because normally they're plastic and you know how cold weather and pl they break very easily um right. i mean they are sturdy obviously because you know fish but they're they can still break if you step on them um and then you have to be mindful of your line because that tangles up really easy too. And it's wet. So when you bring it up, it freezes and you can get it frozen together. So if that happens, you either have to like dunk your line in this, depending on how much you have, um, that can be just create one giant knot, um, or take your gloves off, um, and just warm them up that warm it up that way. Um, yeah, it's not as easy as just reeling in a fish. Um, I don't think I want to do it no more. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you see, the nice thing about the tip of those is that it's literally just like catfish or carfish. You, you put a, and you usually go for bigger fish, let's be honest here, with a tip up. You don't go after bluegill with a tip up. You're going after pike. You're going after lake trout, brown trout, rainbow trout. I mean, splake, char. Yeah. I mean, all those, uh, all those bigger species that are just looking for a free meal as they go by. They may not even actually be actively feeding, but they see this dead bait floating there or a live bait. I've seen people use both. I use and, live. Uh, well, I use yeah. uh, a crappy rig. So on the tip up, so I have two hooks uh -huh. and I use a live on the top. Like I hook it on the back fin and, um, and then a, normally a dead one on the bottom. And um, that way it kind of looks like the dead one's struggling a little bit more. Like he's not all the way dead. Sure. Um, 
That's how I know. You, let me ask you a question. If you're doing that do you, with a live bait, do you have to worry about the tip up being too sensitive or anything and getting off, going off on accident just because of the bait? The, and actually I was going to touch base on this. Um, when you were talking about other fish, not just predatory, um, because bluegill and like perch, they will bite tip ups, but they don't really have enough force to really kind of set off the flag. Um, and if they do, like I mentioned previously, like they don't really bite the hook. They'll just like grab and go. Um, and normally you're prepared for a larger pike. Uh, so you have a larger bait fish on there. Um, so they just get free meals. Um, but that's constantly like, you'll get a flag and there, there's nothing on it. Um, and, but you have to pull it all the way up, rebate, um, to know but yeah uh sensitivity definitely matters i got you well so good to know that you can actually set that up to be more sensitive or less sensitive obviously i didn't think about the line freezing being a thing i don't remember that being a thing but it makes sense i did know the reels were under the water to prevent freezing yep uh, and there's a little um on the bar there's uh a straight power probably about a width of a pe pencil where the flag kind of knocks in so when the bail um starts moving you can see that um pencil like thing just starts spinning um which is a really really nice to see if it's spinning when you get up to that flag because you know there's a fish on it and right yeah and then we talked about jigging through the ice let's talk about let's, let's touch up on safety on ice fishing for sure i mean I think most people that ice fish on the regular tell you like 10 inches is like the absolute minimum before they'll start even considering going out if, on, uh, to be safe anyway. I've, I've heard, you hear yeah. stories all the time, people going out when it's thinner and falling through and stuff. So I'll be honest. I normally go fishing at four inches of ice uh, as long as it's good, solid blue ice. Um, and why don't, you, why, why don't you explain that a little bit more too? Because most people aren't going to think there's different kinds of ice. Okay. Yeah. Um, so normally there's two kinds of ice. There's blue ice, which is what you want. Uh, blue ice is really strong. Um, and then there's white ice. Now white ice is the stuff that when snow starts to warm up, it thaws, it kind of forms that slush on top of the ice and then it gets cold. Uh, so it freezes over and there's, um, it's just not solid. You can have eight inches or 10, 12 inches of white ice and fall through. Um, which happens quite a bit. Um, but four or five inches of blue ice, you can, you can fish on that. I, um, once knew a guy that would go fishing on two inches of blue ice and just wear a life vest. He was crazy. Right. But he never fell through. Well, life, I guess life as he is, he was, he was, uh, he was conscious of the fact that he could fall in and at least he would keep him at the, at the, at the hole. Cause what, one thing people don't think about when you're ice fishing, once you fall through that hole, it's not like an open water where you fall off and you can literally be right where you fell in at. You literally can go four or five, six feet under just from the way your water displaces you and everything. And then all of a sudden you're nowhere near your hole. There's people that yeah. drown every year and they just find their bodies in the spring because they fell through and never got back up. And, well, it's hard to re do a recovery too because there's not a lot of people that's trained in that. And if there's a crack or like a part in your dry suit, um, you know, you you can be 20, 30 feet looking for a body and instantly start going into shock because you know you're warm and then it's um, that water's freezing. Um, <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Yeah, right, for sure. The body isn't prepared for that really. Well, and so yeah, and so that's, that's the reason why those people are getting found in the spring instead, because all of a sudden they're floating later on. Not that we want to go all grim and dark, but I mean it's just something to keep in mind. That it's a totally different animal. Yeah, uh, and actually a couple of people um, that I know last year now they're, they're older because um, you know old people retired go fishing. I would do it every day if I was retired. Um, <laughs> you and me both, man. <laughs> but um, they you know lived on this lake for 30 years um got overly confident and took a shortcut which is very uh you can kind of tell by the currents uh where the good ice is going to be and where the bad ice is and they just uh got on their quad and they went out fishing and they wanted to take a shortcut and um they fell in they both of them almost passed away just because they just got too confident 
Um, sure. It's just like anything else. You got to respect it or else you're, you know. And that's another thing you touched on too. For those who don't know, a quad is a four wheeler or a four by four or whatever else you want to call it. It's an off-road vehicle. There are people in certain areas of the country that ice fish that are willing to drive their truck onto the ice. Oh, that happens every January. year. Or snow, or snowmobile, and all that stuff. I mean, and and it depends on the state, but a lot of those states, once they fall in, it's a mandatory fine. And on top of oh, that, yeah, you have to pay right. for the towing and recovery. On top of that, you have to pay for the insurance because your vehicle is completely totaled, pretty much. Yeah, I when it gets that think it's a ten thousand dollar fine. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very steep penalty for sure. So a wetsuit, um. And a dry let me, suit. Let me, let me pull that comment up for those who can't see. Okay. The difference. He, he's asking for the difference between a dry suit, a wet suit, and a float suit. And which one he's going to want in Virginia. Like Sam was saying, I'm sure, long, long story short, a wet suit is a basically made of neoprene. Uh, it's yeah. essentially skin tight. And what it does, it, it creates a layer of water tight to your skin that acts like a cushion. Or an air pocket. It, it, think of air pocket between your skin and the water, where it's That's like a not medium. really an air pocket because that would make you feel. It's, it just right, right, it's not air, air but I, I'm just saying. Right, it's just a little area of mediation between your skin and the water. I have no idea. I do not know what a float suit is. I am not sure about a float suit either. But uh, okay. a dry okay. suit, a dry suit is 100. Uh, percent It's it's made out of a lot of them are made out of rubber. The old ones are. There's definitely newer materials and that stuff too. I can't tell you what they are off the top of my head. Yeah, but super the idea with those, the idea with those is they have gaskets everywhere where your body part or extremity comes out. There's gonna be one on your neck, there's one on each wrist, one on each foot. Um, unless you get a dry suit that has booties, because you can get those as well. Um, and what that does, it prevents water from getting in as long as it fits the way it's supposed to. It prevents any water getting in to your core. Yeah. Uh, so your head's the only thing that gets wet. Your hands are the only thing that gets wet. And in the case of the ones without booties, your feet are the only things that get wet. Um, and it's just and like those are super insulated too. Right. They're super insulated. They they allow you to wear other types of clothing underneath, so you can keep them as warm or as cool as you want. But the biggest thing is that it keeps you dry. That's what has the dry suit. Um, in Virginia, it, it it's not so much a state area thing as much as it's a condition thing. There's a, the rule of 120 says that if you're going fishing in an area where the air temperature plus the water temperature is less than 120 degrees, then you should consider a wetsuit or a dry suit. For most people that I talk to, and this is, again, this isn't a hard fact for me, it's, it's opinion based. Um, there are studies that show, you know, the differences on that. So you can actually get the knowledge and information and make you an informed opinion on this. But almost everybody I talk to that wears a dry suit, is going to wear it if it's the temp the total temperature is going to be less than 90 degrees. And again, both of those suits, the idea is that you, you're trying to give yourself as much time as possible from when you get into the water to recover yourself out of the water. So I feel really like just if depends. you have to think about what suit to wear, I would just go overkill and get the dry suit just because. Well, the other thing know. to consider too, a wet suit is just that you're still wet. That's another thing. So the idea is that the only reason the wetsuit works is because while you're under the water, you have that mediation layer between the whole temperature. As soon as you get back up in the air, that goes away. So at that point, you're just wet and having the wind cut through it and blow onto you and make you really cold. And the wetsuits basically are the ones you see a lot of surfers and uh, uh, whitewater kayakers wear. So they're I'm gonna, gonna get drive. they're gonna get wet and they plan on staying under under the water in contact with the water pretty much the whole time. Uh, for people for people that are fishing, typically you're gonna see them in dry suits. And if they're out in the ocean fishing, I can guarantee you ninety percent of those people are wearing dry suits. And it's literally just because it keeps you dry. I wear a dry suit in the winter on my kayak. So uh, the reason I don't fish in the winter on my kayak is because I don't own a dry suit. Because for my size, they're quite expensive. Uh, for most people, sub three hundred pounds, uh, you can get some some variation. They make they make they make several different kinds. They the full body dry suits are the best protection 
They're also the most expensive and the most bulky and most uncomfortable. Um, there are videos of people that did testing with things called splash tops and splash bottoms which are two pieces, they're pants and shirts that have all the same gasketing. But obviously you have that break at your belt line, essentially where the pants and the shirt meet, which is a point where water can get in. But their argument with that is with your life jacket on, if you're wearing it, for, like say if you're kayak fishing or whatever, or if you're using a weight, like a wading belt, like you use for waders to keep water from going inside of waders, is that makes that gasket fit and not fail and give you more time. But so I wonder. It's also I it's also it, so. right, but but I say it also says the, the, the splash up combinations. Even though yes, they can be 100% waterproof, they are not guaranteed 100% waterproof. But it is guaranteed. It's guaranteed to give you more time to get back in your vessel or on the bank before you get completely soaked. But the I downfall wouldn't. to dry suits. Sorry, I keep cutting you guys off. But the downfall to dry suits is that if you ever have one fail, if the gasket breaks or it gets a hole in it completely useless at that point you're just a water balloon floating around and there's no protection from temperature it's just the raw temperature of the water going in against you at that point so it, it might as well not if it's if it's broken or doesn't fit right you might as well not even wear it so i got lucky and found mine in a, th in a pawn shop and you got really lucky the fact that you found one that fits you and sam what were you going to say i didn't mean to, again i didn't mean to cut you off oh um so i wonder the two-piece wetsuit or dry suit um, I wonder if it fits like my prosthetic, how it's uh, rubber on silicone, so it kind of performs like a little vacuum seal. I don't know, because unless, does your prosthetic, I'm assuming you mean the full entire leg of the prosthetic, obviously, because you're going to be walking or paddling. Well, the line, and well, I was talking about where it like connects. It, um, if it connects for, because of a vacuum seal that it creates, um, because um the top of it when there's no like gaskets or anything it's just rubber on rubber and there's no yeah i don't know uh, man. I, I i'm just wondering if that's what they're thinking i have no idea that'd be that's i mean it's an interesting concept for sure yeah i don't know if that's if that's the right. logic or not but all right chrissy have a good night thanks for tuning in um i am actually because I'm having some issues with the signal and everything. I'm actually going to go ahead and probably cut this episode pretty, pretty short soon. Uh, so let's just touch base a little bit more on this stuff, kind of go over some of what we did today. And uh, again, thanks for everybody for watching. Uh, but open water fishing, if you're fishing in the winter, just some mindset things. Uh, keep an eye on the bait you're using. Maybe change it up a little bit based on conditions. If you are using any kind of natural bait, think about what their behaviors are and what may or may not cause them to do different things in the weather based on the conditions, whether it be weather, whether it be wind, whether it be uh, warm water discharges, et cetera. Uh, consider downsizing your bait because fish are not as actively feeding as much. But just keeping in mind that if you do find active fish, uh, you're more likely to get bit. But on top of that, being able to change spots is going to be a major key or being able to cover more water is going to be a major key. Then for the ice fishing side of things, uh, safety is a different concern because it's a totally different animal. It's different conditions, different situations. Uh, we covered gear such as tip-ups. We uh, talked about the jigging rod, some of the techniques for that. Uh, locations on the ice, how to figure out where to drill these holes at, and the process of elimination for those areas and thinking about the way those species work and how they do act differently in winter. Um, talk about some of the baits talk about some of the species we can catch and how to target different things um and we also discussed also just in general for cold water or anything some about dry suits wetsuits and i still don't know what float suits are i'm assuming it's a combination of that stuff same concept i'm sure idea I'm keeping you war warmer way. uh but it's definitely something i'm gonna look up as well um do you guys have anything to add to that zach and sam do you have anything else to add to that i don't know I'm not very diverse on uh, ice fishing. I learned a lot. Oh <laughs> uh, well, if you ever get some time and you want to come up here, man, let me know. Um, I am probably well, we're looking at moving down south in the next few years, though. So you know, limited time. Yep. Well, come on. Uh, hey, Billy Hondo, thanks. Anything over three hundred pounds? Fishy Fever just got a float suit for Christmas. I had never heard of one, but he did do a video, but I don't think he covered it enough. I mean, that's fair. 
Uh, he may not know entirely what it is either, if it is something new for him. So we'll have to just see how that goes. I will say for the whole dry suit, wet suit argument, even with the two pieces and whatnot, um, I, I can't spilt milt fishing. I think is his name. He is a kayak angler that fishes out in out west in Oregon, or something like that. He did a video about even if you're not going to do those suits, there are some safer options. He specifically did one with uh, waders and a splash top, which I get is the part of that two piece system. But with the waders and the splash top and the life jacket, he was able to minimize water coming in still. And he explains it very well. And he gives you an example of how much more time he had before he was soaked. Uh, it's a very good video to watch. And I would consider that heavily. Um, just to give you an, another idea of at least something you can do if you don't quite have the money to do that. But again, just remember, it's a, it's an opinion based thing. The rule of 120 is an actual thing. It's not a law. You don't have to follow it, but it's definitely a rule of recommendation. And there's evidence supporting that mindset and that concept to keep you guys safer out there on the water. And and I execute it myself. Like I said, I will not go uh, if the temp. I do not go at all if the temperature is below 90 on those two out on the kayak. Um, just because I don't own that stuff. Uh, but I do consider it if it's closer to 120 and higher. Uh, I do consider going out still sometimes. It just depends on the weather and whatnot. But with that being said, uh, unless anybody else has got any more questions or comments, uh, I do think we're going to uh, call this show early just because I am trying to stream this uh, uh, parking lot. Uh, it's been giving us issues. Um, again, thanks to Zach and thanks to Sam for help me co-host this thing. Thanks to all you guys watching. Uh, make sure you share it out with your friends. We're going to do another episode in two weeks. I'll announce what those topics are here shortly in the next, within the next week. And uh, yeah, unless anybody else has anything else to say, we will see you guys in two weeks until then tight lines, everybody be safe. We love you. And we'll see y'all next time.